on that note, um, I want us to open in prayer. We're all going to kind of take a deep breath. And I'm going to read uh, Psalm 1, which is appropriate um, at all times, really. It's a good kind of wisdom psalm for us, but it's also appropriate because we focused on the psalms and wisdom literature this week. So let's all kind of take a deep breath, just relax. And I'm going to read Psalm 1, and then I'll pray for us, and we'll get started. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the steps or in the path of the wicked, nor stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of the mockers and scoffers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on this law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaves do not wither and whatever they do prospers. Not so are the wicked. They are like the chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. God, we are thankful that you have shown us the way to be wise in this world, and that is to cling to you and to follow your commands and to be shaped more and more into the image of Jesus. God, we are very tempted. (laughs) We'll confess that we're tempted often to Go in the way of the scoffers and the sinners and and follow that path because it's easier. It's an easier path. That road is very wide and the road of wisdom that you call us to is very narrow. But God, we know that you're present with us in the journey and that the Holy Spirit is guiding us. And just like the scriptures say that your word and your precepts and your law are like a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. So God, would you help us do what the scriptures say and to truly hide your word and your law and your commands in our hearts. Because the scriptures also tell us that out of the overflow of our heart, our mouth will speak. So God, would you fill us with good things? We believe that that's what you do. Would you help us to that end? It's the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I read this quote this week. It doesn't have a lot to do with, with wisdom literature, you know, Psalms, Job, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. We'll talk about that, obviously, tonight. But I read this quote this week, uh, and I thought that it was good because just kind of in institute, in this endeavor that we all are in together, we are taking in a lot of information, right? It's, it, some of you, you're like, I'm just, it's like a, de, a, de, a deluge every single week, just like drinking out of a fire hydrant, just like pouring like super fast, and I'm trying to like get as much as I can, but it's just so much information. So some of you are in that camp, and some of you, um, maybe you, you have a little bit more training or formal training, even in, in theology or biblical scholarship. Some of you are like, a lot of this is review, but I am picking up new things, and that's good, and I'm learning some different techniques, or I'm learning some different information. So wherever you are on that spectrum, the great temptation, I think, and we've talked about this maybe ad nauseum at this point, but I'm going to keep bringing it up, maybe because it's one of my own faults and I need to preach to myself, Um, but one of the great temptations is that we're just taking in information, and we're just gaining knowledge, and we're never going to let it seep into our heart and then out of our hands and our feet. And so let me read this quote because I, I thought of it I thought of Institute as I read this this week um, and pray that we would avoid that temptation. It says this, Christianity should feel like my love for others continues to deepen, not my beliefs are more correct than anyone else's. Let me read that again. Christianity should feel like my love for others continues to deepen, not my beliefs are more correct than anyone else's. If what we're doing does not ultimately, at the end of the day, just just increase love for others, love for God, love for the world in us, then it's just up here. And that's not really helpful at the end of the day in caring for the world the way Jesus has asked us to and in being like Jesus. So anyways, just something to kind of keep in front of us as we do what is oftentimes a very academic endeavor. It's a lot of reading. 
It's a lot of learning. It's a lot of knowledge pouring in, pouring in, pouring in. But remember, as you sit in silence, as you sit in prayer, um, ask yourself and maybe kind of let the Holy Spirit probe in there a little bit and say, where is what I'm learning deepening and increasing my love for God and love for others? We are about 12, 13 weeks in. So maybe a good kind of reflective question this coming week just to kind of sit with is to say, where, how has what I've learned in the past 13 weeks increased my love for God and others? Not in an ethereal kind of like, well, I now know more, and so my knowledge of God has increased, so I love God even more because I know more about him. I, like practically, practically, how has this worked its way out in our lives? Um, because if we only ever stay in this kind of ethereal headspace, it's not going to move, move through us very well, okay? So just things to think about, things to kind of meditate on. As we talk about wisdom literature, now I know a lot of you, maybe not a lot, some of you, um, poetry is not your thing. <laughs> it's not your thing. Uh, I love poetry. I love poetry. I read, I read poetry often. I think it's a well of just wisdom, and it says things in ways that sometimes I can't say them. Um, I find it very helpful. That is not the case for everybody. But some of you, this was a more fun or maybe a, a easier or a more resonant week than the historical narrative has been. So we kind of like, I, I wanted to split some of the historical narrative because I felt like we were getting a little bit like, oh, okay, all the kings, all the prophets, oh my goodness. And so I was like, let's take a, de- a deep breath, breath of fresh air, get some wisdom literature, get the Psalms, which were kind of maybe more, Psalms really is maybe the book we're most familiar with in the Old Testament. Like maybe really, like if you're gonna have to quote or, Tell me about one of the books. Psalms might be one of the easiest for us to quote and to kind of be like, yeah, I kind of have an idea about what's going on there. Like, not a whole lot of history to remember, really. Not a whole lot of, like, who's in charge. Not a whole lot of, like, different characters to remember. It's just songs, right? It's hymns. It's, it's the church's song book. And it has been for, for millennia now. Um, so maybe, some, maybe you're in one of those, those camps. But poetry, and, and your textbook explains this, poetry makes up about a third of the Old Testament which is a lot. That's a lot. A third of the Old Testament is poetry. Now, we run into something very quickly, and you probably realize this, and you, you, all, were, you all were like, I don't know Hebrew. <laughs> so how can I appreciate Hebrew poetry if I don't know Hebrew? Because your, our English translations aren't rendering things like the rhyming. We're, we're completely missing out on the rhyming that's there. We're completely missing out on the wordplay that's there if you, if you don't know Hebrew. Uh, but here's the good news. The good news is that there are tools and people who have put together commentaries and other study notes and stuff to help you, if you don't know Hebrew, get some of that information. Now, I still definitely encourage all of you, go audit some Hebrew classes. Um, it's very, very helpful. Um, but I realize that not all of you are going to line up and queue, just queue up really, really fast to go do that. But uh, I will tell you that there are tools for you to use commentaries, that type of stuff, stuff we talked about in the first unit. But here's what you can pick up on if you don't know the language. You can pick up on things um, like repetition, be it actual word repetition or thematic repetition. You can pick up on things like, like chiasms, which we're going to talk a little bit more about tonight. That's one of your handouts because it's really, really helpful if you can begin noticing some of those in Hebrew poetry, especially in the book of Psalms. Because the Hebrew writers are not just being like, oh, that's a cute way to write. I think I'll do that. No, there's a purpose. (laughs) There's a purpose to the the madness that we perceive to be madness, right? So anyways, poetry is about a third of the Bible. So we at least need to understand what's happening. You don't have to, like, analyze the poetry. You don't have to, you know, go all, you know, Shakespeare scholar on it or anything. But we need to understand that it's valuable and that the writers are doing something. And it's not just, like, a fluff piece. It's not just, like, social commentary like oh i think it's it's theological they're saying things about god in the wisdom literature of the bible now if you'll notice i did not have you read the chapters in your book on proverbs and ecclesiastes not because i don't think those books are important they are you should reread the, you should read those chapters if you get time but because i didn't want to get angry emails going lorian why did you have us read 150 pages <laughs> This week, so I had to pick, and I was like, "Okay, Job. I know people really get into Psalms, and let's, let's at least read the chapter that overviews all of wisdom literature for us." Um, but let me say this briefly about Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, since we didn't read about them. I have uh, I, I talked to a lot of people 
especially um, parents, if you have kids, or pe- just people in general, if you don't have kids, you've been impacted by this in some ways. Um, and a lot of people ask me, or they're troubled by the fact, they're like, the Bible in Proverbs says, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart from it. And they're like, and my kid is just off the reservation. In whatever way that means for you. Like, my kid is just, I, I, they're, they're wayward, they're the prodigal, whatever word you, need to, you want to use for that. And, and how do I reconcile that? We were in church. I, we talked about God in our home. We prayed. We read the, all the things, right? We checked all the boxes. And my kid is just, I, I don't know. And in the midst of that conversation, I usually am like, you know, I'm so sorry. And we kind of process some of that. But then I tell them, if it's appropriate, it's not always appropriate. I tell them, The book of Proverbs is Proverbs. They're not promises. They're Proverbs. They're wise sayings that generally point towards wisdom and that generally end up working out in your favor. They're not promises. That's not the nature of of proverbial language. Right? We, we all know this. If you read Proverbs from other cultures, you're like, that's a proverb. That's a wise saying. That's something that's generally probably good to apply to my life. Like, that makes sense. But for some reason, when we open Proverbs in the Bible, we're like, it's going to happen. <laughs> and that's not the nature of Proverbs. That's honestly not really the nature of wisdom literature writ large, really. And I think we all know this, but we need to be reminded of it because when we come to the Bible, sometimes we, we get a little weird, we get a little crazy, we get a little obsessive. But Proverbs are wise sayings. They're not promises. And I think all of you can be like, yeah, I've, there's at least one or two Proverbs in there that I've tried to live by. You know, I've tried to be wise. I've tried to not, not open my mouth when I shouldn't. And it's come back to bite you. Even though you did what appeared to be the right thing and was probably the right thing. They're proverbs. They're not promises. Wisdom literature plays by different rules. It's not narrative. It's not historical, um, like like First and Second Kings. It's not just storytelling, like Genesis and Exodus. It's it's different. It's a different type of literature, and it exists to help us be wise. <laughs> it exists to help give us. Wisdom In your textbook, it, it mentions that there are significant, significant parallels between um, Egyptian literature and Babylonian literature. All these different communities and people groups around Israel at the time of the composition of some of this wisdom literature, all these different cultures have their own wisdom literature, right? So in, in Egypt, it references, I think it was Akhenaten. Akhenaten it, it composes this book of wise sayings to give his son when his son becomes Pharaoh, right? This is what David is doing with writing things down that are wise in Psalms and stuff, and Solomon does it. So they're writing down wise things. They're writing down things that are good for you to grasp and that promote a wise life. They don't promote a perfect life. And all God's people said amen. You all know this to be true. They do not promote a perfect life. They promote a wise life And Lord knows we need the wisdom in this crazy, upside-down, messed-up world that we live in. So he's given us these books that promote wisdom, not perfection, not not 100% promise. It's not some formula that if we crack, we're like, if I live my life this way, then God's going to bless me and answer all my things. Job clearly, (laughs) clearly got the short end of that stick if that's the case, right? Job is a very troubling book. Job is an incredibly troubling book for us. Um, Because it doesn't really resolve all of our questions. And their textbook hints at this. Job does not resolve all of our questions. It's, It's a theologically troubling book in some ways. It forces us to wrestle with theodicy, the problem of evil. That's the fancy academic way of saying the problem of evil. Uh, And it forces us to go, okay, so even, even the righteous, even people who are just really you know, 100% in, following Jesus, following God, staying, staying in bounds, even c- calamity will e- strike even them out of the blue for no reason. And Job seems to paint a picture that says, yeah, 
Yeah. And even in the midst of that, God is in control. So we can, we can sometimes kind of write that off and be like, God's in control. I know that at the end of the day, things will be vindicated. The world be, will be set right. Amen. Yes, I believe that. But it doesn't necessarily always help you in the midst of calamity. And so Job points to this and says, what do we do with this? And it offers us wisdom in the face of trials and frustrations and temptations. And it also offers commentary, um, even though not directly. It offers commentary on the people that you surround yourself with when you're in those difficult situations. We get the people around Job offering what really does appear to be to them on the surface wise sayings. They're like, Job, what's going on in your, in your secret private life? Do you have unconfessed sin? Like, these are questions we ask people sometimes. Like, we are those people sometimes. And sometimes you need to ask those questions. Sometimes we need those people. We need people to ask us those questions because sometimes there is. But then they start offering this social and theological commentary. And if you notice in your textbook highlights this, God gets really frustrated with them, not so much because of the social commentary they offer, but, but, but because they misrepresent God. That's the frustration, the beef God has with Job's friends, is that they misrepresent God back to Job. They speak incorrectly about theological things. They speak incorrectly about the way God is working. And they presume a lot about God that they do not know to be fact, which should be some major, like, scarlet red flags for us, just waving in the wind going, how are we offering commentary and help to people, and sitting with people in their grief, and all this stuff. Again, wisdom literature. It's offering us ways to be wise. It's offering commentary on, here's some ways that we can process and think about when things go really, really just bad, and here's how we can process that with people who things are going bad for, and here's how God responds. Oh, and by the way, here's a massive, massive reminder about how big God is, and about how small we are. But God still cares deeply for us. The commentary that we get from God towards the end of Job where God finally like, there's this like crazy, like God like rouses himself and he's like, okay, here we go. We're gonna, <laughs> gonna address this now. I've let them kind of just, you know, spew just random stuff for like a few days now. I'm gonna step in and actually like address the situation. And how does God address the situation in Job? God does not sit down with Job and say, Job, here is my 10-year plan for your life. Here's why this, Job doesn't really get a why. He doesn't get the why this, the reader, we know through, from the narrative kind of why it happened. It's not necessarily even a very satisfactory answer for why it happened. But how does, Job, how does God respond in the book of Job? What is the wisdom that is in the book of Job? God's response is God's identity. God responds in the book of Job with God's own identity and says, here is who I am. Oh, and by the way, were you there when I made the world? Mm, nope, didn't see you there. Are you there when all, do you see every little thing that happens on the planet? Oh, no, you don't. Okay, whoops. Then shut your mouth. It's kind of like God's a little bit frustrated at this point. But God's response in Job is God's self. It's not a, here's why this happened. It's not a, here's what I'm going to do to fix it, although there is a kind of a remedy at the end, although how do you actually replace children? Like, is it a remedy? Not really. It, it, it kind of is. He gets wealth back, but there's part of it, there's, like, there's still this like hollowness. But God's response in the book of Job is, is information about who God is, is about God's identity. Again, wisdom. Wisdom. It's not logical, necessarily in our like western like linear minds it doesn't offer us that again job is a very frustrating book to, to us some people love job i'm like it's frustrating <laughs> like it doesn't do what i want it to do and the bible often doesn't but note note this uh in in the book it, towards the later chapters for example job chapter 40 and 41 god says this he says uh, who will, will, I'm sorry, will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him accuse God and answer him. And then Job says, I'm unworthy. <laughs> Job's finally gotten it. 
But God just goes on and on and on and talks about all of these things. And and, in in chapter 39, we get this beautiful, beautiful response from God. This is where God goes, do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Like, you don't see that. You don't see what I'm doing. You don't see creation just barreling forward because I made it that way. Do you see when the bear has, has her cubs? Do you count the months till they bear? Do you know the time they give birth? Do you know these things? We also get the language from Job where, God, where we're told that God stretches out the north over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. And how faint a word we hear of him. And we're like, that didn't sound very faint. That sounded really big. That sounds like more than my little brain can contain. And yet Job is where we get the idea that even all we know of God is not even a drop in the ocean. Wisdom. It's wisdom literature. It's offering you a way to see God and see the world and see yourself that hopefully produces wisdom. You say, Lorian, how does that produce wisdom? For me, one of the practical ways Job produces wisdom is when I get really overwhelmed, which happens, when I get anxious, which happens, when I get depressed, which happens, when I'm encountering the world in such a way that it just feels like it's just going to crush me, I remember the wisdom of Job where I'm told that the things that I know of God which blow me away and bring me comfort in those moments is just but a whisper of who God actually is and how big God is and how powerful God is and how awesome God is. So it produces in me a wisdom that lets me say, the world is saying this, and my body is saying this, and all these things are saying this, but I have wisdom in the marrow of my bones about the God of the universe. Wisdom literature. It's wisdom literature. This is what, and then, let's let's look at the book of James. We're going New Testament for a second. We're going to kind of cheat a little bit here. Because as we talk about wisdom, as we get into the Psalms here in a second, this is good to know. Take a look at James chapter 3. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open it up. Don't just take my word for it, guys. Check it. James chapter 3, starting in verse 13. This is James, the brother of Jesus. So we would hope that James would know something about wisdom, right? Like you hung out with Jesus. You were like reared with Jesus. Hopefully you came away from that experience with like some good wisdom. Like you're one of the closest people to Jesus for a good bit. Hopefully you got some wisdom out of that. And this is what James says in James chapter three, starting in verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? So that's, that's a question, who? How are we gonna, and, and then it begs the question that he then answers, how will we know? Who, who's wise among you? Well, how do, how do we find that out? He, James tells us, let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom? Uh Uh-oh. Wisdom is supposed to produce humility. (laughs) Not haughtiness, not I know more than you-ness, not, but wisdom according to James and according to the story of the Bible, really, if you think about Jesus being like wisdom incarnate, wisdom is supposed to produce humility. So let him show it by humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter, uh, bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, Do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such, quote, wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and he calls it demonic. Whoops. Verse 16, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. So he's giving us a juxtaposition of wisdom from God and wisdom from the world. And he calls wisdom from the world demonic. That's a serious accusation. It's a right accusation, but it's pretty serious. Then he says this in verse 17, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Let's read that list again. Verse 17, but the wisdom that comes from heaven. So this is what reading the scriptures and pursuing God and being formed in the image of Jesus should produce in us. It should come from heaven, so it's not earthly wisdom. And it's pure, peace-loving, 
considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. And I got to tell y'all, I fall short of that list seven days out of the week and twice on Sundays. Like, I'm not hitting all these. We're, we are collectively as a people not very considerate. We are collectively as people not full of mercy. We are collectively as people not generally peace-loving. So where is the wisdom? The scriptures would maybe point out we don't have a whole lot. Where is the wisdom? James tells us, let's show it by how we live in this world. Let's show it by being peaceful people, considerate people, full of mercy people, submissive people. And that is not the way the world thinks of wisdom. But again, James points out, and again, the whole scripture really points out, that the wisdom of the world is not really wisdom. It will fail. It's going to point you in a bad direction because it points towards evil. But the wisdom of God, hopefully that we're kind of gleaning and learning, points us towards all of these beautiful things and life f f uh, that's fulfilling and eternal and all that stuff. So anyways, that's wisdom according to James, the brother of Jesus. Probably good idea to pay attention to that. Um, okay, so let's pause right there. Um, I don't have a lot of answer. If you have questions about Job, Job is not my, my bailiwick, but I'm happy to have conversations about Job for probably about five minutes. If anyone has questions, comments, thoughts about Job, um, I would love to give us space to do that because I know it's a fascinating book and I, I'm not trying to diminish that at all. It's just not my area of expertise at all, um, but I'm happy to have conversation around it if you guys have things that you want to know or process or talk about. So let's give space for that for just a second. And there's microphones um, on the, these first two tables that we can pass around. Okay, great. Okay, Allison needs a microphone. Just make sure you put that switch on. Not yet. Not yet. Oh, now, try it. Okay. There you go. Um, can you answer number two for us? <laughs> sure. Can you Love read? You, I don't have it in front of me, but can you, can you okay. read that so to me? I just, this is where I was like... Uh, um, you know, back in high school, you really wanted the answers in the back of the book. Right. <laughs> I, and now I'm like, I actually would use the answers for my own, you know, benefit. <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't be cheating. Right. <laughs> uh, but so the question is, what does the book of Job offer as an appropriate response to suffering? Mm, yep. How did you answer that? <laughs> uh, I literally took a quote from uh, that chapter on mm -hmm. Job. And I said, we often cannot know what causes our suffering, but we can take comfort that all is in the hand of an infinitely wise and sovereign God. So, I mean, yep. I kind of took that to mean, let's not question mm -hmm. why, you know, yeah. like they did. I mean, the um, what's the what's the term that they use? Like the um, thank you, yeah, retribution. Retrib yeah. yeah. So, like, don't yeah. don't assume that because you're suffering that you've done bad or, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. I mean, that's kind of... Okay, let me see. Did anyone else answer that that would be willing to share their answer so we can get a little bit of a collective thing and then I'll, I can comment on it as well. But I want to kind of, let's work together a little bit. It's on the side of it, right by that white sticker. You just push up on that thing. This? There you go. Okay. Yeah, I'll try it. Why not? Um, I had that Job tells us that we should have faith in God's wisdom and his plan for our lives. It tells us that we... Do not live under the retribution principle, i.e., if you're righteous, you will prosper, and if you're wicked, you will suffer. The retribution principle applies to final judgment, but not as to day-to-day -day living, as we are called to believe and worship an infinitely wise and sovereign God. Okay. Anyone else want to throw their hat in the ring? Yeah, can we get a, a microphone back here? Uh, yeah, basically... Um one, God's not under, not under obligation to make sure that the righteousness, that the righteous receive blessings and only blessings. Mm -hmm. And though we cannot get enough information, we cannot get enough information to vindicate God's justice. Um, we we do have enough information to be convinced of His benevolent wisdom, and God's wisdom exceeds all human wisdom. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, so let me let me throw kind of a little bit of extra commentary. Great answers. Thank you, thank you for those of you who jumped in. Um, I think that one of the ways Job answers, you know, how do how do we respond to suffering? How do we respond to this? Um, again, is is kind of what I said. Come, I'm coming in the back door a little bit here, um, but kind of what I said. It God's response to it is God's self. So I think part of it in this. This is obviously, and all of you know this to be true, it's so much easier to stand up here and say this um, than to actually live it out, is to trust the nature of the Father in the midst of, of the suffering, uh, which, again, not very good at that. Um, but it, it is to, so, so I think one of the answers that the book of Job gives in response to human suffering is God's very self, because that's how God responds, is God's identity and who God is, and what God does in the world, and how intricately involved God is in the world. He's not, and we'll talk about this when we get to the theology section, he's not, um, the metaphor, the, the word picture is the clock maker that makes the clock and then steps back and lets it just go. That's not God. God, according to Job, according to the, the rest of scripture, scripture writ large, is very intricately involved in the creation, in all of the things that he's created and done. And so I think part of the way we answer that, and the way Job answers that, the book of Job, is just God's nature. Uh, that's the response to suffering, is, is trusting somehow that God will set things right. Um, but that's a really big answer that doesn't really help us sometimes when we're in the midst of, of suffering. Um, the other answer that sometimes I give that I'm honestly not even personally overly thrilled with, but this is, so the, the topic of suffering is hard, right? E the topic of evil is hard, and, and I fluctuate on how I respond, and which is okay, you're allowed to fluctuate and change your minds. Um, but one of the things that, that I kind of use to respond is that this world is just radically broken. And we, we acknowledge that, right? As Christians, we acknowledge that. Um, we acknowledge that something is fundamentally disconnected and broken with how the world is supposed to be operating, right? And so suffering, pain, all of death itself, all of that is wrapped up in the brokenness of the world, right? And so I think another way that Job responds to suffering is to, is to just acknowledge it. Because in the, sometimes Christians, we don't do a good job of acknowledging suffering and of acknowledging pain and of sitting with people when they're in that mess. We like to just slap a Bible verse on it and say, I can do all things through God who strengthens me. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you need extra help because the things that you're trying to endure are, are very difficult, and yes, God's going to get you through that, but don't slap a Bible verse on it and try to make it feel better. That's not the point of the Bible, right? The point of the Bible is to give us wisdom and to tell us the story of God. So I think that one of the ways Job responds to it is it acknowledges it, and God's response is God's very self. And that's kind of where I have to settle with the book of Job, uh, because it doesn't answer the question. It doesn't really give us the answer that we're looking for if we're looking for just like a, here's why this happened, let me roll it up and give it to you, it's, it's God saying, things are going to go wrong in this world. It's not, you know, if you're, if you're doing well, that means you're extra blessed and you must be in God's good side. That's, and it, it dismantles some of that, which I think is helpful for us because we want to think that way sometimes. We still get tempted to think that way. Like, my life is falling apart. God must be really upset with me. There must be something going on. Job dismantles that, right? Job rips that apart um, and doesn't leave any of that standing. But I have to, and I keep saying this, and I know I keep saying this, I have to go back to Job and rest in the fact that, that the way God answers that question is with God's very nature and is with God's self. Um, and you have to kind of dig for it, right? You have to, you have to kind of realize what the book is doing. Um, but I think that's how the question ultimately gets answered. I mean, realizing that God is in control and that God will set things right um, which, again, feels really far away sometimes. It, it's, it's hard to kind of grasp that, but that's where I kind of land on some of that. Yes, I'm going to microphone. After this, we'll wrap up, Job, and move on to Psalms. Hi, uh, Gussie. Yes. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I've been studying Isaiah, and, and a, a lot of repetitive themes in Isaiah seem to be repeating in Job. Mm. Uh, uh, seem to re be repeating in a lot of different places, and it's it's the idea of waiting on God. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if there's something of that in Job. Mm -hmm. 
that 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 the book is trying to tell us. Yes, I would I would agree with that very much. That there is a as there's an aspect of, of of waiting, and of patience, and of seeking the Lord in our pain and in our frustration and in our darkness, um, and a, and of really <laughs> through prayer. Some, I mean, sometimes even just begging God to show up, right? And of waiting and patience. And then you're reminded of passages that are like, you know, God's timing, like day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day. God's timing is on our timing. Um, so that the, the, necess- the necessity of waiting on God and patiently seeking after God is, is very true. But I think it's also a wisdom principle, right? Again, throughout this wisdom literature, we see this pattern, even in the Psalms. David's crying out, God, God where are you? Where are you in this mess? You know, waiting on God, um, which requires wisdom and patience. So that's that's a great point. Um, okay, let's look at let's look at the Book of Psalms. Uh, a few things about Psalms, just kind of right off the bat. Um, one of my pet peeves, and this is just me personally, um, is that people don't they don't speak right when it comes to how we reference the Psalms. So here's just this is for free. Um, it's like how the book of Revelation is not called Revelations. Those of you who did Revelation with me know this. Some of you just realized that. There is no book called Revelations in the Bible. The book is called Revelation. People call it Revelations all the time, and that's not the name of the book. That doesn't exist in the Bible. Okay? Psalms is similar. When you're referencing the book or when you're referencing several Psalms, it's plural. So we're talking about the book of the Psalms, or Psalms 1 through 6. When you're talking about one psalm, it's psalm. (laughs) It's not Psalms 2. It's not Psalms 34. It's Psalm 34, Psalm 2. Okay, just FYI. Again, that's for free. Yes, yes. (laughs) Wisdom, wisdom. I'm sharing wisdom with y'all wisdom. Uh, But anyways, uh, yeah, so the book of Psalms has been um, used in the church and used in uh, synagogues and used in even non-religious settings all over the planet for millennia. The, The Psalms are just this treasure of the church. They are a treasure of humanity, really. Why? Because they are the original songbook of God's people. This is where the this was like the original like for those of you who know music like this is like CCLI, this is where we get all like our rights and everything. This is where like we get our lyrics for our songs. The Psalms are just a treasure trove of theology, of just practical w- wisdom and daily living. Um, but they are beloved by the church. Why? Not not only because we are familiar with them and, and comforted by them, but because the church has used them for so long. And here's the other thing I love about the book of Psalms. It's not a place where, generally speaking, and believe me, you can, but generally speaking, we can hop across denominations and be very comfortable with each other when it comes to the Psalms. No one really is getting hot and bothered about things that happen in the Psalms. And I appreciate that. Because you can go to a Catholic church, you can go to an Orthodox church, you can go to a Lutheran church, you can go here, you can go to a Baptist church, and the Psalms are really comfortable in all of those settings. Why? Because the church and, and our, our Jewish counterparts have realized for a long time the value of the Psalms. Now, the Psalms get classified in, in our book and kind of in the way things work as, as wisdom-type literature, right? It's poetry. They're telling us, you know, things about God, but they're also giving us different scenarios. Like, if you do this, um, you know, God, God, would you help me in this situation? Here's how, here's how I'm going to process that, all these things. Um, now, the Psalms give us a lot of that, but they also, they also give us permission. And this is another thing I love about the Psalms. The Psalms give us permission to be human. The Psalms give us permission to be human and to be human before God. The Psalms give us permission to be human before God. David gets real upset in some of the Psalms. I mean, and it it is very accusatory towards God. 
Where are you? Why haven't you answered me? You didn't help me in this time when you said you would. All of the, David gets very belligerent, and other psalm writers do too. And God doesn't get upset. God listens, and generally God responds, right? But the psalms give us permission to be fully human, our full human selves before God. They allow us to bring our joys. It allows us to bring our triumphs our successes, our wins, but it also allows you to bring your failures, Psalm 51. It allows you to bring the places where you've messed up. It allows you to talk about the places where God has not met your expectations. And it allows you to talk about places when you're angry and when you're upset and when you're frustrated. The Psalms open up a well, the wealth of human emotion before God and God just takes it all in and is very gracious and responds in psalms. This is why we love the psalms. This is why you can generally find a psalm to fit just about any day you're having. <laughs> so, <clears throat> my, microphone. I have a hard time um, sometimes. I feel like I'm stealing someone else's plea mm. and someone else's pain. And I feel like I am invading in someone else's mm -hmm. petition to God mm -hmm. when I'm reading Psalms. Yeah, it's a, that's a really common thing. If you did not grow up in a liturgical church, which most of us in this room did not, some of you did, I know. But if you didn't grow up with liturgy, where we repeat the same thing every week and it doesn't bother us because it still connects us to God and it doesn't need to feel fresh each week, um, we, sometimes people have a hard time with, with using what we perceive to be like pre-written prayers, right? We're like, I didn't write this, so it's not sincere. It can't be sincere for me. It absolutely can be sincere for you. It absolutely can be. Um, and what I tell people who, who that feels kind of strange to them is I just tell them, start praying a psalm a day. Start, pretend today is the first day of the year. Start with Psalm 1, tomorrow do Psalm 2, whatever. But pray and read a psalm a day. And sometimes it's going to be... Like, that was not for me today. <laughs> Didn't get much out of that one. And that's okay. Um, but what we can begin to do is begin to adopt. This teaches us language and this teaches us ways to talk to God. This teaches us how to talk to God, how to praise God, how to do this. And it's not giving us like, a, this is the only way you can ever do it. But it's saying, hey, you're human and you don't know what to do sometimes, so here you go. Here's a helpful way to do this. Here's a helpful way to offer prayer. Here's a helpful way to offer praise and song and supplication and anger and all of those things before the throne. And then you become more comfortable with this type of language, language and with this type of like way of interacting with God. So for example, um, look at your textbook. Let me grab mine real quick. I want to highlight a few things in your textbook. Page 434, page 434, that little excursus, devotional use of the Psalms, really helpful information, kind of, kind of like to your point of what you're just asking. Um, the Psalms help us to borrow language from this. They help us to relate to God in just the day by day. Like, they're, they're just kind of there for us to help us process life, to help us relate to God in the day by day. Um, but this also notes, like, hey, you, we can't just make them mean what we want them to mean <laughs> to help us have warm, fuzzy feelings. Like, they have meaning. They have original context. We can't just kind of throw away biblical interpretation when we come to the Psalms. That's bad. That's bad theology. That's bad biblical interpretation. But the Psalms give us a composite view of God over time, that shows that God responds to God's people, that shows that God can handle your emotion, that shows that God is present with you in those things, and that shows us ways to praise God. Again, wisdom. This is wisdom literature. This is showing us how to act and how to behave and how to process life and process our relationship with God and with each other. So I just want to point that out. That's a good, good little situation to have there. Um, you get... Psalms in different categories, and your, your textbook does a good job of explaining this. There's five main sections of the Psalms, and it breaks all those down. That's in your book in a chart, a nice chart. I'm not going to go into that a whole lot because it's there for you. But I do want to talk about, I want to talk about two things specifically. I want to talk about what do we do if we're, if we're using the Psalms as a prayer book, which is what they are. It's, it's a prayer book that, that you're, you are free to use. You're free to steal the prayers. 
Um, what do we do with the really tricky, difficult ones that get kind of violent and they get, make us really uncomfortable? Um, specifically like Psalm 137. Um, how, do we, how do we process Psalm 137? Let me read it for you. It's towards the end. <clears throat> Psalm 137 says this. By the rivers of Babylon we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. Okay, straight off the bat we're given context. This is an exilic psalm. People are in exile in Babylon and they're remembering their homeland. Okay, that's, that's the context that we're given. So by the rivers of Babylon we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars were hung our harps. For there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of us. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. So their captors, the Babylonians, are mocking them. They're saying, why don't you sing some songs about your homeland? Go for it. Entertain us. There's, there's the, they're mocking the people. Verse 4 says, how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. Remember, Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to its foundations. Daughter Babylon, doomed to destruction. Happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your babies and dashes them against the rocks. What do we do with this? What do we do with this type of language, with this type of psalm? Do we pray it? Do we sing it? How do we handle it? This is, we're, we're tracking with them until like verse 7. Verse 7 things take a sudden like right turn and we're like, I can't follow you there. Like, whew. But here's, here's what I think psalms like this open up for us. Again, they open up and invite us to present before God the breadth of human emotion, of human trauma, of human frustration that we all have. And the psalm, like, a psalm like this looks at us in the face and says, you can bring that to God and it's not going to scare him away. God is not disturbed by the anger that is in your heart. God is not frightened away. God isn't like, well, you shouldn't have done that. God receives this type of human emotion. And the Psalms invite us to bring it before God. Because that's the only place, the feet of the throne is the only place that something like this makes any sense. The foot of God's throne is the only place where we can really lay all of the anger and the frustration and the pain and the anxiety and the worry and just all of it. The foot of the throne is the only place where any of it can make sense. And so I think the Psalms, again, wisdom literature, are offering us the only wise way to process this. And that is to give it to God. Not like a quaint little like throw pillow that someone like crocheted for you that just says, give it to God, like phew. No, 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 but like really, in the marrow of your bones, can we, can we read things like this and go, you know, I've never maybe been that angry, but I've been angry. And I've had injustice done to me, and I need something bigger outside of myself to help me process it and to take it for me. Because it's not wise, again, wisdom literature, it's not wise for you and I, mere humans, to try to process all of that anger and grief on our own. We simply cannot. We simply cannot. And I think all of us know this to be true. We've had different scenarios in our lives where we're like, I need to take all of what's happening inside of me and give it to someone else. <laughs> and the Psalms, again, give us, they kind of take off all the pretense and all of just the nice clothes we want to put on when we try to come before God, and they say, just come. What are you angry about? Have you told God about it? Rather than just complaining to your friends, have you actually told God about what you're angry about? H have, you, have you done that? Have I done that? The Psalms say, do it. Ecclesiastes says, do it. <laughs> Job says, do it. It says, talk. Proverbs say, hey, do it. The wisdom literature invites us into conversation with God. 
And it says, what are you upset about? What are you joyful about? What are you happy about? What do you need to remember? And the wisdom literature is just held out like this beautiful gift to us saying, hey, here's how you do that. You actually talk to God about it. We, like, we, we are much more comfortable oftentimes talking about God than talking to God when it really should be the reverse. We should be much more comfortable talking to God and have a little bit of trepidation when it comes to us actually talking about God. Remember Job's friends who misrepresented the divine. Bad. And I think the Psalms and the other wisdom literature help us do that. They give words to us when we are so beyond being able to concoct our own words. Now, they're also very technical, <laughs> some of them. And it's beautiful because Hebrew poetry is super cool which is what the handout in front of you is. Um, let's, let's look at that. Look at the page that ha that's longer, that has color. Let's actually look at some of like, the technical aspects of the Psalms uh, because they, they, they do that. And part of, the, part of what the technical aspects do is actually point you to and highlight certain aspects of the Psalms that we sometimes miss if we just read them like, kind of like just straight through. So this is Psalm 46. And this has a very, if you remember back to biblical interpretation, this is a chiastic structure. Like the Greek letter chi, you know, like the X, so you have like a little X thing. That's why we get that. But it has a chiastic structure. So it follows a pattern and kind of ends where it started, but we're, we're kind of in a different place when we end, even though it ends with similar words. Like we've gained some knowledge. We've gained wisdom because we've read the psalm. Now, take a look at this. You have A, B, C, D, E, F, okay, at the very top. And then as you go down, you have F prime, E prime, D prime, C prime, B prime, and A prime. This is poetic kind of structural language. Uh, again, some of you I know, you're like, I really don't like poetry. Um, but but this, this helps us understand what the psalmist is doing. Because here's how it starts. God is our refuge and strength. Great. We're like, amen to that. Love it. This is great. This is going to be a good psalm. I like it. B a very present help in trouble. C, therefore we will not fear. Okay, now let's stop right there. I want us to look at the A prime, B prime, and C prime at the bottom. So what, what is the opposite? And it doesn't mean, I don't mean opposite like, oh, it disagrees with. But what is like the corresponding aspect of the psalm? Okay. For A, it starts, God is our refuge and strength. A prime, very bottom of your page. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. That's two ways of saying similar things, but we're getting more breadth, we're getting more wisdom, we're getting more a bigger picture of what, the, of what that strength looks like, okay? Go to B, a very present help in trouble. B prime, the Lord of hosts is with us. God is present, God is with us. He is with us in our trouble. Again, saying the same thing in different words, we're getting a bigger picture. We're getting a, a, a more breadth added to this. C is really interesting. C says, therefore, we will not fear. C prime says, this is where we get C striving, or be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. So if the corresponding aspect of that is the first C from verse 2, therefore, we will not fear, it's really interesting because that's one of the verses that we like to quote a lot, be still and know that I'm God. But the psalmist correlates be still with do not fear which I think adds even more depth, right? Be still and know that I'm God is a great verse. It's a powerful verse. We love to quote it. But when we are able to begin to see that the psalmist through poetry is correlating that with the concept of do not fear, therefore we will not fear, therefore we can be still and know that God is God. Do you see how beautiful that is? And again, no one's expecting people to just come up with this on their own. Commentaries will help you with this. Now, sometimes you can sit down with a psalm and you, it's pretty clear. This psalm is pretty clear once you kind of know what you're looking for. Um, but commentaries, other tools are helpful with this. Keep going. Take a look at D. Though the earth should change and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, the mountains quake at, at its swelling pride. That's the first part of D. D2, there is a river whose stream make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. Look at D prime. So what's corresponding to this? Come, behold the works of the Lord who has wrought desolation in the earth. That sounds pretty familiar. That sounds a lot like it's, the earth is changing, mountains slipping to the sea, waters are foaming and roaring that we get from, D, from, from D1. D2, he makes wars to cease. 
He breaks the bow, cuts the spear in two, burns the chariots with fire. Um, interesting correlation between D2 and that. Does that. You see how strange that is? Go back up to D2, verse 4. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. And D prime 2 says he makes wars to cease. Interesting. But when you think about it this way, think about what is, what's God's city like? It's peaceable. Things are set right. There's no war. There's no, there's no calamity. There's no destruction. So if God is going to have a place where there's a river that makes, this makes glad the city of God, and if we're going to trust that that's a good city, then in D prime, the two, it says he makes wars to cease. Why? Because there's going to be a beautiful, good city where there are no wars and spears and chariots. Does that make sense? Again, I know this is a little bit kind of like you got to really dig for it, but there is gold to be had here. This, is, like, this adds much more than just reading straight through the psalm. Like the straight, straight through the psalm is great, but this adds a level that is just really, really interesting. Take a look at E, verse 5, the first E. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. Pause. Pause. Guys, I have to tell you something. I see this verse quoted by so many women about themselves. <laughs> I'm not kidding. You look at like high schoolers' Instagram pages, this is the verse that they're a girl in church, this is the verse that they have. It's not about people. This is about the city of God. This verse is not about you as a person. It's about God's city. Let's do better. Let's do better. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. That's E. Go down to E prime. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Again, it is, it is expanding on ideas and helping us gain wisdom. It's showing us a breadth and a depth that we don't get necessarily if we just read straight through the psalm, okay? Now take a look at F and F prime. Now, wherever that point hits, wherever the middle is, is, is usually kind of important. Um, it says this, that the, the nations made an uproar, the kingdoms tottered, and he raised his voice and the earth melted. This is kind of like saying, really, really compacted, what a lot of the psalm has already said, that the, that the earth is raging, wars are raging, um, but God raises his voice, God acts, and all that goes away. That's what we have at the center of the psalm, is that the earth is raging, but when God speaks and acts, all of that melts away. On the back of the sheet is a simplified version of what we just did. It doesn't have the whole verses. But you see, God is a refuge is one. Go down to 11. God is a refuge. No fear. And then if you go down to where it says 10, B, and it says B, it says be still. Again, correlating. Not have, the reason we can be still is because we don't have to have fear. And then it goes on. And I'll let you guys kind of look at that. But just that's an example. And again, no one's expecting, hold on, give me just a second, I'll come to you. No one's expecting us to just be able to sit down and go, I'll just find all the chiasms there are. Because sometimes they're not, and sometimes we manufacture them because our English translations are weird. Again, commentaries will help us. Don't feel like, I'm just going to miss everything in the Psalms because I don't know how to do this. No, 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 no. Get a good tool, get a good study Bible, get a good commentary, walk through some Psalms. You'll see it, you know. You'll begin to notice it. Depends on who you ask. <laughs> Again, some people see them when some others don't, but I think that there's some pretty clear ones. I think Psalm 46 is a good one. I also think Psalm 1, if you want to practice, Psalm 1 that we read at the beginning is really good, um, especially the first few verses. Let's take a look at it real quick. If you want to practice this later. The first few verses are, are really easy. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the way of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the company of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his, while he meditates day and night, this person is like a tree planted and yielding fruit, and their leaves do not wither. So you get this idea of like, it's almost like the first few, the first two, ver the first verse is like go, you're going downhill, like it's bad, and you're progressively, you're progressively becoming stationary. Do you notice that? You're, you go from walking to standing to sitting. So the ver you, you're just going like, it's progressively like, whoop, like this is a bad progression. But then the person who delights in the law of the Lord and they meditate on, on this law day and night, then you get this like opposite. They're, they're like tree planted by streams of water. They yield their fruit in season and whatever they do prospers. So that's kind of a little bit of a sample. 
Um, my encouragement, if you, if you want to start noticing this, is to use commentaries, um, because sometimes the commentaries will point them out and say this has a chiastic structure. Um, you know, it's, it's a good place to kind of start and look. Uh, Catherine had a question. I want to make sure I, I get to you. Can we get Catherine a microphone? Um, on this psalm, how it was in, inverted or whatever, how, I, I expected D to be D1, 2, and then the bottom D to be D2, 1. Do you know what I'm saying? I do not know what you're saying. You know how it goes like A, B, C, D, uh -huh. downward, and then yeah. opposite, back upward. So uh -huh. the last part of D, I would have thought would be correlated to the first part. Oh, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Um, it's not. <laughs> Is that just typical? If there's more than one point to a letter, it's not. Sometimes you could, this, this is like, now we're getting into nuance of like how you want to organize your outline. We, you really, we really could have just said D and got written of, gotten rid of the one and the two. And that'll solve your problem. Good? Okay. <laughs> Good question, but yes, yes. Um, okay, questions, thoughts about Psalms, things we want to talk about, process together. Um, and then I'm, I have a few more things to say, but I want to give us some space. Anything? Yes. It's on. It's on, okay. Regarding this chiasm, mm -hmm. how often do commentators disagree on how the chiasm is structured? They do disagree. They disagree on everything, though. <laughs> um, but there, I, I, would, I would say that there are some psalms, for example, like Psalm 46, that the general consensus is like everyone sees this. Like everyone sees Some Some commentators go a little gung-ho with it. Um, some commentators are like, nah, not so much. But I would start, again, as you read the Psalms, and as you become more familiar with them and practice with them, um, I think if you have like a commentary or two, you'll begin to notice, okay, the general consistent consensus is agreement upon these, this set of Psalms or whatever. Um, but they do disagree. But again, Psalm 46 and, and others are pretty much like, that's what's going on there. Like the Hebrew, especially the Hebrew poetic scholars are like, yeah, that's what's going on there. Um, yes. I think you're good. Okay. Yeah. I think, and this may have been in the reading that I that I just don't remember. But uh, so the purpose of that chiastic structure was really just to emphasize their point in a uh, in a poetic creative way. Yeah. poetic way. Okay. Yeah. It's yeah. it's poetry. Yeah. It's poetry. Okay. Um, and it helps us again, if especially you can begin to see what is the psalmist core again, especially in, in verse two. And in verse 11, the, the, the C, the, um, I'm sorry, the C's, yeah. The, do not fear, and then the, be still and know that I'm God. The, the, the psalmist is drawing some conclusions for us and kind of pointing us back to that. Um, so it's poetic, but it's also kind of, here's, here's why this matters. Um, now, do you have to understand chiasm to have the psalms bless you and speak to you and, and help you pray? And all? No, you don't. Um, I think they're helpful. I'm, t I'm kind of again, giving all information that, hey, this exists in the world, this exists in the scriptures, this is how Hebrew poetry functions. Um, but if you're like, this freaks me out and I don't like it and it's going to actually hinder my ability, like, then, you know, take a deep breath. Again, commentaries are great. You don't have to do it on your own. You don't have to, like, manufacture it on your own. Um, Carolyn, did you have a question? Can we get Carolyn? Hey, Allison. No. Can, you, can you get Carolyn a mic? I was just going to say, it's like diagramming uh, yeah. sentences <laughs> in English that I had to do. Yeah, as an it's English not for every. Oh, she's, she's. Oh, my bad. <laughs> so on the book, on page 432, it says the retribution principle. Mm. It says the principle can be summed up in two-part affirmation. The righteous will prosper and the wicked will suffer. And... I guess when I think of prosper, I think of not everybody is always prospering. You can be prospering, and, and I don't mean just financially, mm -hmm. but you can also have suffering simultaneously. There's multiple facets yes. going on in your life. Yes. And so it's like when you pray, you can pray 
for all the blessings you've got, but then there are, let's just say, disasters happening yeah. simultaneously. So, so this doesn't really just ring true with me. How's that? Well, yeah, and, and the book doesn't agree with it. The book is just saying this is how the ancients often thought. And we actually get when you read the Old Testament, you get a little bit of this. Because God even's like, if you do this, I will bless you. <laughs> like, there's, there's, and so we have to process, what exactly does that mean? Does that mean that things will always go well? You know, and, and the answer to that is no. Just like you said, Carolyn, because death is still happening around God's people. Like, illness is still happening around God's people. Even in the Old Testament, like, even, even the people of God in Israel. Like, God says, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless you if you remain in covenant with me, all these things. And it's like, okay, we get blessings. We get covenantal blessings. We get God's presence. But that doesn't mean that, like, our family doesn't eventually die and that, like, maybe I, like, get injured or maybe, you know. Like, even God's people in the Old Testament kind of knew that wasn't true. It just didn't come out in some of their, the ways they wrote. Um, but, yeah, you're exactly right. You're, the two can happen together, yes. And, again, remember that the ultimate blessing is God's presence. That's the ultimate. The ultimate blessing is God's presence. Kind of like, Carolyn, you mentioned, it's not like, oh, I'm financially doing well. It's not, oh, my kids are, are great or like we're all healthy. It's not that. The ultimate blessing is God's presence. So in that way, you can kind of gauge like, where am I at? Like, am I, am I dwelling in God's presence? Am I experiencing God's presence? Am I receiving that aspect of blessing? Um, or am I kind of like doing my own thing? And avoiding the wisdom, again, that's found in God's presence. Um, so, and yeah, but exactly, you're exactly right. Yes, Amy. I would just like to add, like, this kind of ties back to what we were talking about with Job and just kind of how wisdom literature is linked together. Yeah. It's like, in, in light of that, then, we can, you know, strive, I guess, to be like Job and like maintain our integrity mm -hmm. in the midst of our trials, you know, yeah. with, with this in mind, you mm -hmm. know, like, I don't know about y'all, but whenever I'm going through some hard times and I, uh, my, uh, you know, upbringing with some like prosperity gospel, which mm -hmm. is like, oh, okay, so it kind of comes from the Bible in a sense. It's just a skewed, you know, mm -hmm. gospel. Um, I don't know. I just, there are times when you just want to be like, screw it, yeah. for like lack of better words, you know, on? like, like, why, yeah. right, but it's like, just that reminder, like you just said, it's like, you know, just stay focused on God, and, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, anyways, yeah, and, how, and again, and I think, it's a great point, because what sitting with texts like this does, is again, hopefully it produces wisdom in us, and we desperately need wisdom when we come to calamities, and when we come to frustrations, and when we come to hardship, it is wisdom in how we process that. It is wisdom in how we remain close to God through that. It is wisdom in how we listen to advice and don't listen to other advice in that. The wisdom that the scriptures produce, and not just the wisdom literature, the whole Bible, is, is offering us wisdom because it's offering us God. <laughs> yes, David, and then we're gonna, let me let you do your question and we'll move on. You, you were talking a lot about wisdom and a few decades ago, it was very popular to talk about personification of wisdom. Uh, it still uh, is. Uh, someone called Sophia. Yeah, Sophia, Lady Wisdom. I, I was wondering if you could address that. It wasn't sure. addressed in the book at all. Yeah, so wisdom is, is often personified, um, even, even in um, Proverbs, um, wisdom gets personified. And in ancient Near Eastern literature and in extra biblical literature, we get a lot of um, language about Sophia, which, which just means wisdom. Um, but we get this, some, some scholars call it lady wisdom. Um, but wisdom is often personified as a woman, um, which is interesting. Um, in the Bible, even, it is, uh, especially in, in books, in wisdom literature books, especially in Proverbs. Um, and extra biblical literature literature around outside of the Bible, but around the Bible that supports the Bible, that gives us kind of extra information, um, deals a lot with, with this idea of the personification of wisdom um, and how wisdom is actually a character um, and is something to be pursued and is something to desire and is something to, um, you know, want to be involved with. Um, but yeah, and that's, 
there is a lot. If that interests you, let me know, um, because there's a lot of scholarship on that that we, we just because of time I can't get into right now. But it is a, a conversation um, where you get this personification of wisdom as an, as an actual character. Um, Sophia, which again means wisdom. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a big part of Old Testament biblical scholarship and wisdom literature specifically is, is who is this character? How does this character play out? Um, what's the purpose of this character? Um, yeah, so gr- thanks for bringing that up. I, I had re- regretted to mention that. Okay, um, what I want to do real quick is I want to, uh, because again, I think the Psalms and wisdom literature give us wisdom. They show us how to process what God is doing. They show us how to process what's happening in us. Among other things, right? We can't touch all the things that these things can do. Um, but, but I want to do three, three things. I want to read a psalm to you, and I'm going to do that tacky thing where I'm going to have you close your eyes and take some deep breaths, um, because I want us to kind of illustrate the role that psalms can play in our lives. And then I'm going to play musical versions of two psalms that are very, very different from each other. <laughs> like literally about as different as you could possibly be. Um, so that we can kind of see how the psalms have impacted the church how the Psalms have impacted worship, and how they continue to do that. So let me, let's do this reading first. Um, so just kind of put your, if you're holding something, put it down. Put your hands in your lap or, or whatever is comfortable and just kind of sit for a second. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still and quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Do you feel what happens when that psalm is read? Do you, f- do you feel it? Something happens in our person when we read the Psalms, especially when we read Psalms that we're very familiar with. Psalm 23 being one of those. The Psalms are a gift. Use them. Use them. Pray them. Read them. Use them. 